What's up, guys? Here, welcome to the Heads Up Podcast. Today on the show, I've got none of them. My buddy, client, good friend, Gary Bender. Uh, Gary is a CFO for many years, probably more than he wants to admit to. Uh, but he's been around the block and back. He understands the world the CFOs live in. He's actually an owner of a company as well, so he knows the ownership side. He's handled some lovely HR duties in his past when he's when they've made him do it. He also runs a group called CFO Solutions that meets on a monthly basis to talk about best practices as a CFO out in PA. And I've had the the honor to speak a couple times at his event. And uh, Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Great to be here. So, you know, I, I, you gave me this stat a long time ago. It is my favorite stat. And uh, I use it in a lot of my talks now because it kind of puts the CFOs on notice because they don't know what they don't know. What's that? What's my favorite stat that you always give so me? 15 years ago, the average, pri- the, the average tenure of a private company CFO was 84 months. People are startled when I tell them the average is now 28 months. And people always turn and say, well, that's because of mergers. And I will tell you, you've got a decline of almost 55 months, 56 months. The the fact that company A bought company B and company B CFO lost his job accounts for less than one month of the 56-month decline. And and why is it that why is it that is so short now as as compared to before? CEOs have gone through some tough times in the last five five years. And they realize they need a CFO advisor. They need a, a, a trusted advisor as CFO, not a backward-looking accountant or controller. They need someone who can assess risk, drive process improvement, be honest with them, challenge the status quo. And if you can't do that, either the CEO or the board is going to look for somebody better. And I'm astonished, even in my group of CFOs that we talk to every month, I'm astonished they don't know why they got replaced. Yeah, you, you've seen the turnover because you, you're usually helping these guys get jobs. Can you back up for a second? Just def- define the different types of CFOs because, you know, I'm in a market where we might have the CFO title, but I think they're the farthest thing from the CFO because my, my thought and understanding was that it's more of a strategic position, and I see very different from size companies or different CFOs. Now, me and you, we got along because I walked in the meeting and – well, I should say the second meeting, I gave you the numbers. I think I was in and out in 15 minutes mm-hmm. because you got it. So talk to me about the, 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 the actual role of a CFO, the different types, maybe what a C, some of the people that are actually a CFO and those that are kind of pretending to be one. About half of the, half of the top financial execs in, in private companies, and I'm talking companies from $10 million to $250 million. So, you know, that's, that's America. That's probably 70% of the... Employment in America is in those kind of those size companies, regardless of the sector they're in. Most of those folks are controllers. They might have the title of CFO, vice president of finance, director of finance, but most of them are controllers. They spend their time ticking and tying, looking in the rearview mirror, closing the books, and providing some some traditional accounting report to ownership. They should be the top financial executive in a company. Most companies need a strong controller and they need a super strong CFO. And I actually use the term CFO plus somebody who can take the tasks that the CEO or COO don't want to do, put them under the CFO's responsibility. We'll figure out how to optimize processes, drive productivity, usually absorb those processes and reduce costs, reduce risk, drive cash, and probably even reduce payroll. People say it can't be done. We do it every day if you know what you're doing. So, so are you calling them maybe a CFO plus now because it's like everybody's a CFO, or they just take? No, the I'm title? saying the goal is to become a CFO plus. Uh, as I look across the CFOs that we mentor and coach, less than 10 percent have the aptitude and risk profile and intelligence to be a CFO plus. The, so, to, to come back in your point, 50 percent are barely good controllers. And when that's you, the that's the dangerous part. Yeah. When you when you gave that stat, of, you know, uh, revenue, we, we live in a world a lot of times where it's number of employees. Is that playing to it or is it strictly typically a revenue based? No, no. I, I see bad CFOs at five hundred million dollar companies. But would the CFO exist on a 25 life group, 100 life group? Sure. Yeah, sure. My company is 70 employees. 
Okay. The owner and I both have but very, you very strong... You, under, you understand the reason to have one. I feel like when I meet with these groups and if they're under 100 lives, or, it's usually not a CFO, it's a controller. Absolutely. So do you see that you know, the market where they're, they're in the hundred plus market, there are certain size companies only, and they, they just don't have them in smaller companies. They don't think they need them. Well, usually they can't afford it. Yeah. To have a CFO, a CFO is going to earn at least twice as much as the controller. The controller will satisfy the bank, satisfy the auditors, provide some basic level of information. And if you don't know better, you're satisfied with that. Is, is this controller kind of like a, an in-house CPA? Is that, their role to an extent. Yeah, it's the in-house accountant. Yeah. And, and rear, rear view mirror, tick and tie, keep the bank happy, keep the board happy. We like to call them historians. Is that maybe a, a pretty good term for them versus the, yeah. the CFO? CFO. Oh, they're far from a CFO. So give me, the, give me the different, the key differences, you know, as we approach a client that has a controller versus a CFO, we're going to get into discussions on language and, and, and um, what they each do, but w- what way am I communicating I have to understand the communication difference between the two. Well, if you're talking to the controller, you've you've got a challenge because they're they're looking they're looking at history. They've got a certain sense about what's going on in the, in the current marketplace, and they've got a certain sense, very limited, of what is what do the next couple of years look like for the business. So, in a, in a lot of these small companies, they don't know what's in the owner's head. They don't know what's in the board of directors' head. Is the economy growing? Is our sector growing? Is is technology going to replace us or, 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 or support our growth because they're not in board meetings? And, and frankly, they probably shouldn't be in the board meetings. You, you, you'd hope that you've got a director who's got the financial and visionary acumen that complements the CEO. Most controllers don't. So, so back on point, you're dealing with a historian, to use your term. So you start to, start to ask the question, what I would suggest to, to guys like you, if you're talking to a controller, is understand the trend in history, either in their business or in the small small hundred life you know sector, to use your example, and then and then have them compare their history to the market history, and then throw them a curveball and say, here's what best in class is doing in that sector. So take your hundred lives in manufacturing or in nonprofit or academia, whatever information you have, and show that the best in class people aren't going up eight percent per year and raising deductibles and raising co-pays and squeezing the cost of the employees and actually showing that best in class processes and practices by by really good brokers who are aligned with the client not aligned with their compensation model their historical model that they can develop a win-win solution win for the company win for the employees and the broker can win because the broker earns that on a performance basis i, I think you want to take you know, again, upper quartile, why are they holding their costs flat? And just stress to even a historian accountant will understand 8% per year. In, in five or 10 years, you've doubled a pretty significant line item in your budget has now doubled. Are they even responsible, though, for the budget? When you're in a controller position compared to a CFO, CFO is, you know, bottom line, that's their responsibility. That's what they get fired over. Is a controller even responsible? Are they there to just check their boxes, do the work, and go home? Two thirds, you check the box, go home, follow, keep the auditors happy, so you're not found to be doing sloppy accounting. You're not found by the bank to be doing fraudulent accounting. Mm-hmm. And fraud may be a, a degree of a, making a mistake and, and not understanding the loan agreements or the or the reporting agreements. That's that's the most that two thirds of your controllers can do in small companies. Okay, it's a tough job. So you would you would. Am I, am I right in saying a controller would be more like a, if you're going to an accounting firm that does taxes and does auditing and, and uh, strategy, right, advisory, would a, would a controller be more of like the accounting and auditing and the CFO be more the strategic advisor Absolutely. for the company? Even the tax piece. Okay. Because so, to, do, to do tax planning, you have to know what's going on in the future and the risks. To, to use your example, and it's a good example, to accounting and audit are all in the rearview mirror. Okay. So it's hard to drive your car if you're looking in the rearview mirror, and you're talking to somebody about driving their car for the next year or two, making plan changes that are strategic, that benefit employees, retention, recruitment. They're not in that world. So you have to find a way to bring them into that world. 
And the best one I can think of is, let's look at, uh, let's look at history. For people your size, this in New Jersey, in our give example, give history to the historian. Is give that history saying? to the historian, but break it out to there. There are people di- that are not following the norm. Here's your average. Let me show you upper quartile and, and lower quartile, and just say bring three or four years of your history. We have it in the plan documents. We have your history, and let's look at the total spend because you've been squeezing costs most likely to your employees. So let's look at your total spend and where would that put you? on a ranking by quartile. You're going to find, statistically, if they're even taking the call from a new broker, if you get your foot in the door, that, that at least half are in the lower quartile. You just have to hit them on the side of the head with information they can relate to. And what is what is the hot button for a controller? What, what is their number one objective or goal that if I'm in a meeting and I'm trying to convey a message to the controller, and we'll go to the CFO because it's very different. What, what is the message maybe I want to convey to the controller and hit the hot buttons? You're in an area that you've never been trained in. The market data is incomplete and biased. There is fake news in the healthcare marketplace about what expectations are, so give them the facts. If you give a historian the facts, they can relate to it. They're not so good on a projection. But if you give them the so facts, don't give, don't give them the, the typical Geico, I'll save you 20, 40% next year or five or, or years. Don't give, save them this. The, don't give them the fear message that it's going up 10, it's going up 10%. So my 8% increase is, is great. I'm doing my good job. You don't need to talk to anybody else. Just look at history. And, and the reality is, let's say it's your, your current account and you either want to educate them to do a better job and to introduce some, some things that can help them. Go back and, and even take a current account and look at the history and say, you've been doing 5 or 6% per year, and you felt pretty good about it. What if I show you, using your data for the last three years, had we done this, this, and this, you could be at zero, zero, zero without squeezing the balloon to your employees. Oh, I like that. So it's, so instead of showing what could be, we're going to show them what could have been. What could have been. In the past. Use their data. Yeah, okay. It, the, that's their data. Use, use they, their own information their, yeah, against use them. Use their bullets. That's interesting. You sh- shoot them with their own bullets. Yeah, I've, I've typically, I, I, you know, I've done it before, but I've, I've strayed away from it. We're so far looking in the future, but I guess you make them, you know, feel bad for what could have been done. No. Versus. No, they're not going to have feelings. No. Give them the facts. Give them the facts. Don't, don't, don't play on their emotional part because it's not their money. Okay. And the employees don't complain to the controller. They complain to HR or they walk out the door. So don't go the field part. Show them the data. Okay, so so let's switch over to the CFO. CFO, when we're when we're talking to a CFO and we're talking about savings, right? So we talk to a CEO, which you are, you know, you're an owner of a company as well. So you know, hey, I'm gonna let's look out five years, let's look out ten years, right? We're long term planning. What does a CFO mind look like? Because you just gave me the stat. What was it thirty months? Twenty eight. Twenty eight. And falling. It'll yeah. be 27 Almost next time we talk. Two year, a little over two years. I don't know if I'm going to be there for five years. That's right. I don't. Do I care about the five-year projection, the 10-year projection? What do I care about? Today? Two years? What am I looking at as a CFO the, the as far as impact? The answer is next quarter and next year. Like like five quarters is a lifetime. Really? Yeah. They're two looking two at years a quarter, is an eternity. Look, we're looking quarterly as a CFO. We're looking at it on a quarterly basis. A lot of CFOs came out of the public corporation world where it is quarter to quarter. In a small business, you're looking a year or two max for a variety of reasons. So I want to I want to look at my numbers and focus more on the short term. So that leads to the problem is short term gains means change, right? And no change is opportunity. So change is, change is a positive word, and the CFO is going to understand that. Here's the op- and, and I'd even suggest use the word opportunity. Here's an opportunity to improve. If you're having trouble re- retaining employees, if you're having trouble recruiting employees, benefits are, are a decision item. We've got a 1% unemployment market. You have to steal an employee from another company. Healthcare can be the tipping point. And you've done it for our company. You know that. Not, not, I'll compliment you once in this. <laughs> we, we eliminated the, as you know, we saved enough money that in year two, the two owners of our company, we decided to eliminate deductibles for our employees. And they were stunned. And I had two industry-leading uh, experts that I was trying to recruit for the last three years. 
my, my salary offers, my incentive offers were outstanding. What both of them came to me within a month after we eliminated deductibles and the marketplace knew it. They yeah. accepted the salary offer I made them two years ago. I would have raised the salary offer. I would have raised the auto allowance. They had both dealt with twelve to fifteen thousand dollar family health care expenses in two thousand and seventeen. We made our change in two thousand eighteen, and they joined us within a month. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge benefit, and we you know I can't tell you in this tight labor market how many calls I get where employers are now acts, asking me to talk to the recruits and sell them on the health plan. And I said it's interesting because health benefits, health insurance now is becoming what it what, what it was originate, originally for was a benefit an employee benefit mm -hmm. versus just an expense and something to deal with. So it's interesting. So let's go back to the CFO for a second. So we're we're thinking strategy. If I'm in a meeting, I'm I'm going to talk to him about a, a short-term gain that he can he can capture for himself. How do I how do I convey that message? in his terms or in his language? Like, what is your thoughts as a CFO? Just give, just give me some CFO talk. Okay. So we're talking about healthcare expense. It, it's, it's fairly easy. I mean, all of the CFOs know their numbers inside and out. They, they know that healthcare benefits are probably their third largest expense on their cost stack. They can't, they can't change pricing in the marketplace. Their job is to manage the cost stack. So, you know, that's, that's one term. You know, in your cost stack for this year, for this year's budget, what's your total spend in healthcare? But more importantly, how significant it is to the company? Okay, it's number three. Let's say it's five million dollars a year. Use some easy numbers. And how much is it going up, John? It's going up eight and a half percent. Is your revenue going up eight and a half percent? Hell no. Uh, is, is your labor cost going up eight and a half percent? No, it's about three. Revenue's going up three or four. You know, we're lucky to give salary increases and wage increases of 3%. So why do you tolerate benefits going up 8.5%? So we just talked about revenues capped. You know, probably your, your raw material, your technology costs going up like 3. Technology might be going down. And yet you you're, seem to be satisfied, other than the fact that I'm talking to you today, about benefits going, at, going up 8.5%. What it, you know, you want to talk about how to, how to change that curve. You want to talk about an inflection point because that's what we do for people. And you just talked, you were talking about managing. And I got to ask the, the million dollar question, which we struggle to understand is why are more C, why aren't more CFOs control controllers, owners, presidents, CEOs involved in not the, just the decision, Right, not that one-hour meeting and saying, "Hey, we're going to pick that plan." Why are they not involved in managing the healthcare budget like they are in managing the safety programs regarding P and C, property and casualty insurance? Because you guys have done a great job of not providing information during the year. We get an invoice. Let's take that five million dollar example. We get an invoice for about four hundred thousand dollars a month. We budget five million dollars because you told us to. You get a bill every month for $400,000. And by the way, you give us no information on claims and frequency of claims. And is it, are they accidental claims, uh, annual physicals and mammographies, the good maintenance, best practices. Once a year, and I'll, I'll pick on your industry, once a year the Go brokers come in. <laughs> I will. You once a year brokers. the brokers come in and, and give us the gross numbers, no supporting detail, and then treat us like mushrooms for twelve months. I you've, you've and heard, they just so we've just you've trained. You've heard this story before. Let me define what I said ten years ago, and and my my broker advisor, who I trusted and respected, almost passed out when we had a, a lunch and we had a hundred employees there, and it was the annual. Your costs are going up, your copays are going up, your deductibles going up. So nobody in the room was happy, and I opened the meeting by saying, "Let me just set the stage for today's meeting." We do not have health care insurance. All of a sudden, the pizza slices were set down and the chatter stopped. And everybody said, what do you mean? They said, very simply, we pay these guys to, to pay claims on, your, on our behalf. And we pay them a profit margin and we give them all the cash up front. And if they need more, they raise our price next year. 
So basically, there are our check payers. They don't care who you use, how much you eat and drink and don't exercise. In fact, they like when you eat and drink too much and exercise too little because then they can raise our prices next year. And the state allows them to earn a reserve. The state allows them to put an overhead factor on it. The state allows them to get a profit. So they're just really they're happy. Just financing it for us. You know, you're paying to finance it. And we're giving you a markup and a margin. Yeah, bookmakers. But we don't have insurance. We're just paying you to administrate our bad health habits. And everybody got them. So, so CFOs, CEOs, they're just not managing it because, as Craig, Craig would say, we trained them like elephants. We're elephant trainers. We've <laughs> trained them to expect there's nothing. There's a poll. 81% of CFOs think there's absolutely nothing they can do to lower health care costs. So we've done a good job. It's a good answer. Brokers have done a good job at training them in that mindset. And so, not providing any information to allow them to, to, to challenge. Half them. broker's fault. Depending on the market oh, no, size. that's your goal. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> some of it's the insurance companies don't allow it, right? So listen, they've set up the game, they built the game, mm -hmm. and the game's running well, okay? My next question... It's a trillion-dollar industry. That's, the, that's the next million-dollar sort of question is, you're not involved, but now you let a non p l manager who has no, uh, you know, doesn't care about the budget... They get to manage this number two, number three line item at your company. How does that make sense? Well, I'm put you, you on a spot because so, no, you you, you, you guys do it. You guys do it. Well, I don't even do in it. your groups. I don't. You, do you know, it. you know, we have these conversations. You don't. I never met with HR with you guys, but it it happens over and over. So let me give you the statistics okay. out of my groups in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and they're both about forty five financial execs, titled CFOs and controllers. One third have the defined responsibility for HR. They have it. Okay. Another third, approximately one third, feel that if something goes wrong, they'll be held accountable, but they don't have any responsibility to manage it. It's it's no man's land. It is the worst situation you can be in, is to be held responsible but not be involved in the reviews, decisions, etc. That's those are the people that drive the 28-month curve because they're going to be held accountable by the CEO and board, and they should be. A $5 million expenditure, you need to inject yourself, whether it's on your job description or not. A lot of people do not have my, my passive personality, and that's, yeah. that's sarcastic as hell, uh, because well, it's not on my job description, and if it blows up, I'm in trouble, and I'll make an excuse, and I'll be walked out the door. And they should be walked out the door. But that's part of the – That's I, I would weigh that issue with the CEO and the board of directors. If I'm going to hold you responsible to managing our HR budget and being involved – and that's either from compliance and controls to healthcare costs to workers' comp and safety. You don't hold an executive or, or a manager responsible if they're really not responsible. But but again, yeah, third, so they, third so they, they allow them to the manage The final it. third – H. excuse me, the final third HR reports to the CEO – and finance controller CFO knows nothing about it. So I've just given you the situation where the good CFO is going to be responsible, accountable, and, and, and a large portion of them active in it. And that's where you get to the 10 or 15% that are really engaged. You got half of that one third population that don't understand it, put their head in the sand. You guys take advantage of that, see them once a year, give them a few things, give them some, some media bogus trends beat that look like a hero and you disappear for 10 or 11 months and you come back with good news or probably bad news but it's gonna be better than trend so you're still a good guy a good broker they can use that excuse to the board until the board realizes let's go do a third party study let's do a comparison i'm going to force you to bring two more brokers in and go through the, the process so, so it's just it's just again elephant training what we've train the HR to think, have trained the CFO to train the owner. Does the CFO sit and say, well, they report to the board or the CEO and say, well, you know, this is HR, what they came back with, this is the best we can do. And and want to keep themselves out of it because they know, hey, this is a budget item that's it's just uncontrollable. I don't want to take the fall for it. Let HR manage it oh, and they report actually, to me. So they actually invite do HR. They, do that? they invite HR to the board. And, and HR is going to give the little deliver polish, the deliver the message, and they're going to lean back to them. You know, we looked at our brokers, and here's the market trend. Here's all the exogenous yeah. factors. They make all the excuses, then they deliver. 
deliver. It's We're going up eight percent, and the trend's going up nine. We ought to be happy. We we got eight, right. yeah, and we yeah. don't have to disrupt the employees, and we'll squeeze a little more to the employees, but it's not as bad as they could have gotten screwed someplace else. So we're the lesser of both evils. Didn't they do a good job? And then trot out of the room. Check the box, you know. Check it's the box. It's interesting, as I never thought of that way until this conversation. Is like maybe they just don't want to be involved with it because they know it's an item they can't control, and it's I don't want to get fired for. There's it. one more point to it. Most most people in in controllership or finance are not people, people. They do not want people lined up at their desk, at their office door at eight o'clock. Why, why didn't the carrier cover this? Why is my deductible going up? Why isn't this test covered? They don't want to deal with people. They deal with numbers. Numbers don't push back. Even crappy numbers don't push back and cry in your office. We're not <laughs> good at that stuff. HR is compassionate and uh, they'll listen. They, they can't change what, if that test was covered, but they'll listen and be compassionate. We, CFOs are not, we had the compassion part removed. <laughs> we always want to get the message is like, make the decision and then let them, let the operations team implement it. You know, I had a situation recently where it's like the CFO, president, they're there, they love it, they want to move forward, they go back to corporate. And HR just kills the deal. We can't implement it. I'm sorry. We get we have to continue to lose millions of dollars because we don't have enough time to implement this. It's just it's mind boggling to me. And yet they don't push back on the HR department. Why is that? HR Why is it they have so much power control over this these roles that are the CFO? Even the owners bow to it. I'm I'm as befuddled by that. <laughs> That's why every place I've gone in the last 15 years, within weeks of me starting another role at another company, HR has reported to me. And you've heard me say it before. I never asked permission when I had HR report to me as CFO. In some cases, I didn't tell the CEO. All I told him is I'm making changes because it's broken. And I'll tell you what the changes yeah, see, are that I've made. Just, you're just out of the norm, so I'm lucky. Let's sh Let's switch gears here. Talk to me. I know, you know, when I when I got through to you, it, how do we prospect these CFOs, right? So obviously I cold called, got, happened to get you on the phone and got in. But w what is the best way for us to convey a message from a marketing standpoint to a CFO, right? They don't want to talk to nobody. They sure as hell don't want to talk to an insurance broker. We don't. <laughs> You're exactly <laughs> right. Uh, I, I'm an odd duck. I answer my own phone and I also return calls. So I, that's the way I was raised. You're, older, you're old school? I'm old school. That's the way I was raised. When people call you, they call yeah. for a message, and I take the yeah, call. Yeah, in today's world. And if you leave an intelligent message, I'll call you back or email you back. In today's world, they're hiding behind, people hide behind the emails and computers so they sure. can avoid you even more. So how do, I get, how do I get in front of these guys? How do I talk to them? Well, I think you know, you've helped the CFOs in my group because I knew you were smarter than average. I knew you understood and can communicate to us. So... You know, I'd, I'd say to any broker, find somebody that understands the CFO world and get in, in front of their groups. Yeah. We, we do have CFO groups. They're rare. CFOs are generally introverted. They, they'd rather be in the office than be out with 10 or 20 peers learning best practices. But there are opportunities. Podcasts make it great. Webinars make it great. Uh, sometimes they, they big ego CFOs? Because brokers do. Because I can get brokers... You just ask them the, for certain things. They got ego, so you get to them. Do CFOs, do they want to be in the spotlight? No, they don't want to be in the spotlight, but they have egos. They have power and control, but they don't have egos. Okay. They, they do not want to be in the – it's hard to get a testimonial from a CFO. You can save them a million dollars, put them at the top of the upper quartile, and you're lucky to get a testimonial. Sure. I know we, uh, we had some success <laughs> – we had a lot of success when we were in the happy hour. I said, hey, Gary, let's get these guys together because they mm -hmm. don't know each. It's funny is you guys meet every month and I'll ask, hey, do you know so-and-so in the group? They don't know them. And it's like, like you said, they're super introverts. But as soon as we did that happy hour, boy, CFOs like to drink as well. Sure. And it was a good time. We got a lot of people together in a room. We had a good time. We'll do it again in about six weeks. We don't have meetings in December and July. We make sure we have happy hours in those months. The interesting part is I'm always stunned. 45 people that have been together 10 or more times a year don't realize they've got a customer or a supplier in the room. Sure. They don't. Yeah. It's like, well, 
I, I'm in a ma- I'm in mastermind groups. We all know each other. We would do business if we were in the same industry. Well, actually, my newer mastermind is, is marketing, and we do. I've already done business with the guys. It's like, why wouldn't you do business there first? And especially in that local market, I don't get it. But I think we need to do. You got to do more happy hours for sure. Yeah, and we, we people we've changed our process or our, our agendas to drive more conversation. I bring in subject matter experts on a topic every month. And, and for the folks watching this, I let the participants pick the topics. What's keeping you up at night? What are you struggling with? And we go find the experts to address those challenges. And sometimes it's tough to find the experts because we do have some problems. What I've found is that by, by tailoring the vignettes and forcing uh, success stories and failure stories by the CFOs, we find out that collectively we probably have as many best practices as our speaker has. And it's just hard to get CFOs to share success stories and really hard to success, you know, learning experiences, call them failures. How do, how do you get these guys in the room, right? So we have these events, you know, we do a marketing event. Hey, let's, you know, we're going to talk about healthcare. It's hard to get CFOs to show up. You've had a lot of success. I have to believe it's because you're a peer. You're not a threat mm-hmm. to them. They know, like, and trust you. If a broker's going to look to start something like this up, obviously I, I have to assume they need to get a strong CFO client of theirs to get it going. They help facilitate it, market it, and and host these events and do all the work. Does that makes sense? And don't make it a selling event. You're there to make people aware. The reason we've it, been successful is that our jo- our job is to is to share best practices and make CFOs aware there's a handful of, of best practices your peers are doing. We generally have five or six or seven best practices on any topic, whether it's real estate or facilities or leasing or, or a fleet, whatever. Maybe two of those are, are, are possible solutions for your situation. Seven will never be. Most of our CFOs are doing one or two or three of those best practices already, or they or they wouldn't be there more than twenty eight months, to be honest with you. But if you can find one or two pearls, you know, in the bucket of rocks, uh, that makes all the difference in the world. Okay, brokers. Let's talk about brokers. What what are brokers doing wrong? You've been in the meetings. What are, what are we doing wrong in those meetings? When we're talking to the CFO, the CEO, I'll go back whoever. to the first thing I said is use their facts, use history, because your forecasts, like any, like my forecast, your forecasts stink. You're not going to know if we're going to have the catastrophic claim. You're not going to know if, if all of a sudden we have 10 people that need Harvoni and our prescription costs go through the roof. Those are all exceptions. And we can always explain the exceptions. Why don't you just stick to the facts of history? Let's look at the last three years. You have your data. By the way, I have access to your data off the 5500s. I come in here reasonably well-educated. I have your data. It is your data. Okay, if you want to share it and, and, and validate it. But it's pretty good data. Okay, and I can show you, you know, sector information, companies your size in your locale. So I'm not going to use hocus-pocus national averages that nobody can relate to. I'll use data for your sector in New Jersey because New Jersey has its own unique insurance situations, rules, and regulations. And then they kind of hamper small companies. Deal with history. Because as soon as you go forward, you're, 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 you're going to be accused of twisting facts. So use the facts, not the forecast. Got it. What, what and we relate really well to it. Everybody knows their last three years of earnings, their last three years of revenue growth, their last that they've given 25 or 3% salary increases. Yeah, but healthcare went up 8 9 and 8%. And by the way, the sector went up five. If I shine the light on the bad stuff, the history of, you know, what did it go up a couple of years? Well, what did you do? Did you shift costs? Did you do this? Am I highlighting and kind of insulting them in a way? No, you're making them aware. Yeah. Don't I, do it I, I insulting. To... Let, let me, and let's, I'll, I'll do exactly what you did for our group, is it's the only line item that you don't understand every nickel of every dollar spent. I understand labor and overtime and promotions and job eliminations. I understand labor perfectly. I understand my raw material, my scrap rate, and my utilization. I don't even know what makes up my $5 million that was a year that was $4 million two years ago. So let's look at, let's look at what we can glean from the reports you have in front of you. And let me give you some guidance as to what are the four or five categories that make it up. And when you start to tell me 
prescription costs are going up 25% per year. This is going up 15% per year. And by the way, your, your, your annual cost of physicals is going up two or three. Don't beat up the local GP doc. Don't be, you know, you can, you can beat up the emergency room if your if you're emergency room utilization has gone up. You can get some of that information or you can have them get some of that information. But we don't understand the, the components of the cost stack. And you've done us a, a great favor by showing us the four or five categories and the two or three we have to watch. Yeah, it's that just, was eye opening to people. Yeah, it's just managing it and putting it into their terms. What's your uh, as we wrap up here? What's your final tips? Any final tips for brokers? When well, I would. I'll, I'll use this term that I just used with my CFOs. Uh, in fact, I'll give you two two closing points. We call this fall. We call it autumn. I call it the season of insanity. We're about to go through renewals, and you're going to expect a different outcome by doing exactly the same which you've done for the last five years with the same broker. I think you have to understand your information, you have to define your goals, and you have to find a broker who wants to help you achieve your goals, which means the goals of the broker, the advisor, have to be aligned with the, the client. And generally, brokers who work for large firms that are getting compensated six ways from Sunday uh, are not going to be aligned with lowering your costs and lowering your premiums. Their job is to have you up 6 or 7% versus a phony market trend of 8 Okay, Remember, a couple minutes ago, we talked about, let's look at history. We've always heard trend is going up 7 or 8%. You know trend hasn't gone up 7 or 8%. There was a forecast, and it was forgotten. Nobody measured against it. We had your mind sitting at 6 or 7% is better than trend. What if trend really went up 5 or 6% and you were at 6% or 7%? It's like, well, he never told me that, that actually there's people out in the marketplace below trend. Of course there are. No, they're moving trend. There's inflection points in trend. The lines changed. Broker's never going to tell you that. He's already got you convinced 8%. You're lucky to get 8%. You ought to thank me. Where can they find you if they want to reach out to you, see what you're doing? The CFOSolution.org. My phone Gary. number's on there. Like I said, I return emails and phone calls. Gary Bettiners, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us, man. We look My forward pleasure. to having you on again. Anytime. Thanks, guys.